Hey, I'm Chris Zapp from Make Everything, and today we're gonna bring this Wilton back to life. Check it out. All right, so the story with this thing, I picked this thing up at a flea market in upstate New York. Um, I was walking around and I just couldn't pass over it. I think I paid 40 bucks for it. It's been, I think, brazed together. And then it's got this redneck paint job. I don't know if the swivel works. They welded it to like this post and then it actually had a longer post that I cut off. I think it was like stuck in the ground. I don't know. Um, it's really crusty. The first step is gonna be getting this paint off to see what's underneath. Looking like I'm probably gonna wind up making new jaws and handles for here, but let's get started. Okay, so starting out this project, I decided to strip some of the chrome paint off it to kind of get an idea of what I was getting myself into. Um, the first thing I really wanted to do though was get the piece of steel that was welded to the base off. So I got to it with the angle grinder and I'm using a fared cutoff wheel here, just zipping away some of that weld, taking it inside and whacking it with a hammer and a chisel just to pull that off. Now once the vise was actually sitting flat on the bench, I'm using a crimped cupped wire wheel to get some of this paint off. And on my last vise restoration, I got a lot of flack for not using a sandblaster. Um, I didn't use one on this either, basically because I knew I was gonna be leaving this somewhat raw and I just really don't like the look that a sandblaster gives. Had a little bit of trouble getting these nuts off of the pivoting bolts, but it was good to see that the base was fully intact and everything was going to be functioning on that. And just heading through it again with the grinder and stripping off whatever this chrome looking paint is. Now, what I discovered once I started on this stripping was that a lot of the actual vice body had been brazed back together at some point. Um, I was happy to see that the base was in good shape, just really rusty, so that was good, but the brazing on the actual vice body is a little concerning. It seemed pretty stable, so I do wind up keeping it and really just heading through here and taking off the paint. I'm using a variable speed grinder, and this is something I learned actually from the techs at Fared when I was at Spring Make in Ohio this year. A variable speed grinder makes all the difference when you're doing some stripping like this. Keeps the wires from shooting out everywhere. With everything stripped off there, for the most part, I bring it inside and I start to actually disassemble the rest of the vise. Now there are three screws keeping this locking plate in and two of them were stripped. So I went in there with the Dremel and a little cutoff wheel. And here's a little trick. You can actually cut in a slit when you have a stripped out screw and make it into basically a flathead screw. And this will generally work on any type of screw or bolt. As long as you can get a screwdriver on there, you can usually get it loose. So this was pretty chewed up, this little screw, and I was still able to get it out, which was nice. You can see the uh, head of the screw there. Now with that part off, I decided to try and get the bell cap off the back. Now this cap retains the uh, lead nut that holds the lead screw for the uh, dynamic jaw. Now this thing had been welded together. There was like some shoddy looking pins in there, a bunch of goo. So I just basically had to work it off, get those pins out and figure out a way to get these two parts separated. And then there was a bunch of spray painted grossness in there that I had to scrape off, which, which actually let me to see that the back section of this vise was in really good shape. I was really surprised. Once I got the wire wheel on there and cleaned it up, I thought this whole piece had actually been welded and like gooed back together with, with bad weld, but it turned out to just be grease that had been spray painted. So I cleaned up the bell nut and the end of the lead nut, and then I went to work actually pulling the jaws off. So this jaw, one of the screws came right out. The other one was just totally seized in there. I tried it with an impact, couldn't get it off, so I just beat it off with a hammer. Um, this broke the screw inside the jaw, which was a little bit of a pain. I wound up having to drill it out, but you'll see uh, as this restoration goes forward that I wind up having to re-drill and re-tap these jaws anyway. So I did a little work getting that screw out uh, just for the sake of pulling it out, which was not that easy. But once I got that one out, I was able to work on the fixed jaw. So the fixed jaw of this vise was really the 
the culprit. Uh, what I didn't notice when I started was that the actual jaw ledge had been broken off and this jaw had been brazed on. Um, so there were no screws or hardware holding it in, just a brazed joint and the lack of a ledge underneath it would make it so that if you ever hammered on this vise, this jaw would probably pop off. So first I was going to drill out the braze, but it was kind of skipping around on my drill bit. So I decided just to beat it off with a hammer and it actually popped off really easily. But unfortunately that exposed how bad this vise really was. Uh, the entire jaw was totally chewed up. Um, and I realized at this point it was going to need a lot of rebuilding to make it work again. I took the pivoting pin off the bottom of the vise because I was sick of seeing it rock on the table. And then I came up with a plan to add a new jaw ledge to this fixed section of the vise. I moved over to my Bridgeport milling machine and devised a way to clamp this vise down to the bed vertically. And I'm going to switch out this two flute end mill for a four flute carbide end mill. And this is a half inch end mill that I'm going to wind up using. I'm using half inch thick mild steel. It's half by one is actually the dimension of the piece. And I decided if I milled in a slot in the vice body itself, I could use it as sort of a mortise and tenon sort of operation and slide the half inch piece of material in there and then weld it in using the MIG welder and a torch. So milling the cast iron itself was super easy. Cast iron like turns to dust when you mill it, especially with carbide. And I just made this slot slightly oversized and about a quarter of an inch deep on the jaw side. Once I had milled the slot, I milled the actual material itself, so I had a nice square to square mating surface. I wanted this to be super clean, so I milled a section of it up, just sort of squaring off the factory rounded edge that you get when you buy hot roll material like this. Now, instead of just doing a cast iron weld, I decided to use a mechanical fastener as well. Uh, that was just something that I had looked up online and learned about, uh, and I spoke to my friend Matt, and he recommended it as well. So I drilled in some holes, and I'm going to be tapping the vice body with 832 screws so that I have both a mechanical element and a welded element of this repair. Now, I've never welded cast iron before. I'm not really that confident in it, so I figured I know tapping and screwing in material. I know that it's strong. I know that it works. I probably could have gotten away with just doing this uh, mechanical fastener method, but I really also wanted to rebuild the vise itself so that it looked fully restored when I was done with it. I started out by tapping the center screw because I couldn't really get a clamp on it, and then from there, I tapped the other ones using the center screw as the clamp to hold everything in position while I drilled the holes. Uh, I made sure not to go through the back of the vise jaw with this. I wanted to make sure that these were blind taps um, and that these screws wouldn't be visible from the back side. I wasn't sure how welding this was going to be, so I didn't want to try and fill those gaps. You can see how nicely it looked when I just screwed that in with the fasteners and then I went over and used the grinder to V out some of the cast iron and a little bit of the steel so that I could try and get a better weld. Now what I read online was that you need to preheat the cast iron so that the weld doesn't crack so I used my oxyacetylene torch and all I had was a brazing tip but I got this thing pretty hot and I believe that it was hot enough for these welds to stick. The first couple welds I did on the top side of the jaw were really just supposed to be tacks but they honestly turned out terrible. After that, I gave a little more time and care into heating the bottom section of the vise. I focused my heat a lot better and I really made sure that this thing got warm before I tacked and welded it in. I wound up setting my machine down a little bit so my welds penetrated a little bit less, but I figured with the extra heat I didn't need as much voltage. So I continued to heat and weld and build up those layers. Also try to keep this thing hot so it wouldn't cool too rapidly giving it a little more heat, a little more weld as I went, and really trying to fill in that bottom of the jaw. You know, a big part of the Wilton vices is, you know, the shape of the jaw, and I really wanted these to match when they were done. So I made sure to take extra care and add material. Once the bottom was done, I moved over to the top, which was totally chewed up and really deteriorated, and I basically just patched in little sections of weld up here. I was trying to build up the top of the jaw with material, and what was good about this was once I had added a layer of weld to the cast iron itself, I was no longer welding to cast iron. I was welding to basically mild steel because I was welding to my other MIG weld. So 
once I built up that base, it really was just patching in. Um, I gave this thing a couple of hours to cool down because it really was super hot, and then I went at it with the grinder. Now, the trickiest part of this area is underneath the neck, so I used a polyfan wheel from Faird that has the curved edge. This is something that you can weld, uh, grind out the insides of your welds with. It's really, really helpful for shaping and stuff like that, and that curved profile made it so that I could get in there and clean that up really nicely. I used the cutoff wheel to get some of my weld out of that corner and just continued to clean things up. Once I got it pretty close, I decided to cut off the sides of the ledge. I had left it a little bit oversized just so I would have some room for error, but at this point it looked really good, so I cut those off and I took it back over to the milling machine. Now it's a little easier to clamp this in the mill now that it's not vertical. I used some posts and some T-nuts to get this thing in place and I'm still using that half inch carbide end mill and what I'm going to do here is just square up this jaw so that I know sort of what I'm working with and I can line things up moving forward. I'm taking pretty light passes here. I didn't want to take away too much material but I did want to make sure that everything was nice and square to the base and the end mill didn't really have any trouble milling the steel but it certainly likes milling the cast iron a lot better. Now I intentionally milled some of the heads of these screws off. I didn't really want them to be that visible and the original screws and the original ledge would only have projected about a half an inch from the back step so I didn't want it to be sticking out too far. At this point I had cut some brass material to make jaws and I just sort of sized them up onto there and realized that I actually needed to remill both of the jaws. So I devised a way to clamp the vise together without actually reassembling the whole thing using some of my hold downs and I decided that I would just mill both jaws simultaneously so they were perfectly square to one another and also the same height off of the ground so that when I put my jaws in everything would line up really well. Now with the way that I did this, I didn't actually have to worry about squaring the vise to the table because whatever I did here was going to be referencing off itself and I knew that these jaws were going to be perfectly square to one another. This also allowed me to mill the bottom of the shelf on both of these perfect so that they would look exactly identical when everything was done. I'm really happy with this little method. I think it worked out really well and it got me a vise that looked perfect uh, even though it was cobbled together with all this weld material. I had also added a little more material to the top of that jaw so that I would have more to mill off so that I could really square everything up nicely and I squared up the tops of the jaws as well so that it would all look nice when it was blended. I hit it with a file just to sort of clean things up a little bit and essentially the milling on this vise was complete. Going back outside to the grinder, I was able to knock off a little bit of that extra weld and you can already see how much better that jaw looks and how much better the bottom of that jaw ledge look. Now, after all this time, I did not notice a single crack in the weld even though it was on cast iron, so I'm gonna go ahead and assume that my amateur cast iron welds are gonna hold up. Plus, since I left those fasteners in there, I have those to hold things on as well. I had to grind away a little bit of my ledge just so that it wouldn't protrude out past the new jaw. And I'm really happy with the way it was coming out so far. So I decided to continue moving forward and grind out the little anvil section on the back of the vise and move inside. Now I had marked out my jaws so that I could drill out the screw posts for the actual jaws themselves. Now the original vise had 5 16 bolts that were holding the jaws in place. And with all the work that had been done to the jaw, those were no good anymore. So I decided to drill out whatever was in those and upsize them to a 3 8 thread. So the 5 16 uh, when you tap 3 8 you actually drill a 5 16 hole. So I made sure everything was drilled out. And then I made these little templates using Duralar so that I could properly line up my brass jaws. Now the operations on these jaws is essentially the same as I move forward, but I wind up having to make larger jaws and you'll see why. After drilling these out with a 5 16 drill, I tap them with a 3 8 16 tap. Uh, and it's funny, with all the tapping equipment that I have, if you've watched any of my other videos, I have an entire station dedicating to tapping. But I really wanted to make sure I didn't mess this up and since it was such a short thread, I tapped all these by hand and made sure that all the taps were sufficient and really, really clean. Nothing broke and the cast iron tapped really easily, which was great. 
So once I had tapped the dynamic jaw, uh, th this one had the best holes for me to tap because it was originally the 5 16 so those actually were preserved. I just chased them for continuity. Now in the fixed jaw, things were a little rougher because I essentially had to rebuild this jaw with all that weld material. So I was drilling uh, not only cast iron, but a little bit of my MIG wire as well. Things were a little trickier and harder to get the holes the correct depth for the tap, but luckily I was able to make it work with the bottoming tap that I had, keep everything nice and clean, get all that material out of there with the air compressor. Now with that done and my Duralar, I'm able to kind of finally make these templates correct. Now Duralar is a great material. It's like a plastic, but it's translucent. It's really good for templating and transferring marks. Um, it's super resilient and you can use it over and over and over again, not like paper or uh, wax paper or anything. So once I marked out the locations of those jaws, I used the spotting drill to uh, initialize those holes and I stepped up to a 3 8 drill bit and then was able to fit these jaws properly. Now what I realized was the jaws that I originally had made were about uh, one inch in height but with the way that these larger 3 8 16 bolts were going to work the one inch jaw height really wasn't appropriate uh, for the size of that head so I went ahead and I rebuilt these jaws uh, and made them about an inch and a quarter high, which was much better in the long run. So I was able to use that jaw as a template on this larger material because I had drilled the holes correctly. It was easy to just take a transfer punch, but first I had to break down the inch and a quarter material. So I used a tried and true method that I learned uh, from this old Tony, Karate Chop. works really well you just have to practice cleaning up these jaws with the vise um, with a file and then using a transfer punch to transfer the holes through just mark those holes off really nicely a transfer punch is something that you put in a hole and it has a little point at the exact center so you can transfer through holes and always make sure the line lines up really well uh, you can see I was off a little tiny bit on my initial jaw, so I was obviously off a little bit on this one. I had an ob oblong off that hole a little bit, which was really no big deal. And then I could go ahead and move over to the other jaw and just get everything lined up for that as well. Using the same trick with the Duralar, transferring it through, and using the same method to drill those holes with the spotting drill and all that. With that done, knowing that everything threaded up correctly, I can just sort of clean them up with a file and move forward with the next operation. Now the 3A16 Allen head bolts that I have were not fully threaded. So here's a little trick to fully thread stuff like that. I just took a die and I chased out those threads and you can see the difference here, how the thread goes all the way up to the head versus the factory where there's like, you know, about three eighths of an inch of material that's not threaded. That was important to me because I wanted to make sure that these threads were going to hit and I didn't want to damage the threads in the jaws by having them be too short. Now I took a half inch end mill and I went over to the mill and I basically made the counter bores for these Allen head screws. Now there's a bunch of ways that I could have located these. I could have used um, a center. I could have used the dead center. I could have put it in the in the mill and I could have used that to get my exact center so that my counterbore would have been perfect. I just sighted these by eye. They were oversized enough that everything worked out really well and I'm using a two flute high speed steel end mill in this brass. I set my depth stop and everything worked out really nicely. Um, you know, I'm sort of just eyeballing a lot of the machining on this vise and I know I'm gonna get some hate for it in the comments but I like to do things my way and I like to learn as I go. So this method worked really well for me. And in the end, the jaws came out super nice. I cut down the bolts as needed and was able to get them threaded in. I had to grind the heads of the bolts down just a little bit just because they were a little bit proud of the jaws. I didn't want to counterbore them too deep because I wanted to make sure I left some material in those brass jaws before mounting them. Um, I was worried with the heads of these 3 8 bolts being so large, I didn't want to wind up with just a little sliver of brass on the backside. I also made sure to countersink a little bit inside the holes just to make sure everything sat nice and flush. 
you can see how nicely this jaw sits against that new ledge that I made. And I just take the file and make sure everything's nice and clear. I didn't want the heads of these bolts to hit any of the material that I would ever clamp inside the jaws. Now it was on to move to the base. So the original base had nuts on top of these bolts that held the pivot in place. Now this is a swivel base vise, so by tightening up those bolts, you would actually lock this thing in place. And I wanted to recreate the original sort of screw post that should have been on there. Now I drew something up on paper, and I'm gonna be using one inch steel bar stock and three eighths inch steel bar stock to make these sort of movable uh, screw posts. Now this will be a little more like it would have been from the factory. Someone clearly lost these and replaced them with just regular nuts from the hardware store. So back over on the lathe, I take the one inch steel and I just face off one side and I give it just a little bit of a soft chamfer so that it's nice and easy to hold. And I grab a spotting drill, drill out the center, and then I drill it out to the correct size to tap these with a half 13 tap. I made sure that I marked my depth on this because I had made pretty specific parameters for how I wanted these things to sit. I wanted about uh, 0.06 inches of thread. There's about half an inch of thread sticking out of the vise and I wanted to make sure I had enough and nothing bottomed out. Once I had pre-drilled that hole, I just did a little bit of marking um, and did a little bit more facing. I also put a little bit of a mark on the actual piece itself so I knew where I wanted to cut it to. Now before I cut it, I drilled my through hole because there was a lot easier to hold this larger piece in the vise. And here you're gonna see a little trick about drilling into round material. So I put in my chuck and I put a spotting drill inside the chuck so that I can get the initial hole started. Now when you're drilling into a round piece of material like this, sometimes it's hard to find the center. If you use a flat piece of material, the piece of material, if you press the spotting drill against it, will sit perfectly level to the ground when it is perfectly on the high point of the round piece of bar stock. So that's how I knew I was dead center of this material. And I got my hole started with the spotting drill before moving up to a slightly oversized drill bit for 3 8 rod. And again, doing this operation before I cut off the bar stock made things a lot easier because I didn't have to try and clamp a tiny little piece and everything wound up being perfectly square and parallel. After cutting it, I went back over to the lathe and I faced off the top side and added a nice chamfer, uh, which will just look good in the end. Now all this stuff is gonna get heated and blackened, so I didn't have to worry so much about the machined areas, but I did clean things up with a file just to make sure they looked nice. Now I essentially made two of the exact same part. I'm only showing the building of one, but here you can see how I'm using my tapping bench that I had built a couple months back to tap these. Now this is steel and this is a half 13 tap. So normally this would be kind of a pain to tap, but you can see how easily this works using the tapping head. And I'm gonna play this at full speed so you can see how quickly I'm able to do this. Now the idea here is that the tapping head itself has a clutch in it, so even if you bottom out, you don't break the tap, and that clicking you hear is it breaking the chip. Now my vise definitely should have been more well secured to the bench, but in the end it worked for both of these. I didn't break a tap, and I was really quickly and easily able to tap half 13 in this steel with no problem at all. Now with both of these pieces done, I just tested them out on the swivel base itself to make sure everything threaded in properly and they looked good, and then it was on to make the actual tensioning bar and find a way to keep it retained inside these screw posts. Now I thought of a bunch of different ideas. I was gonna get little threaded stainless steel balls from McMaster. I was gonna make uh, little plugs on the mill. I was gonna use bolts and weld them. But in the end, I decided to go over to the torch and the post vise and actually upset the ends with them installed so that they could never be removed but also be a really clean and slim look. Thanks to Chris at Mount Phillips Metalworks for just 
reaffirming the idea that this was the right way to go. So I heated these up with the oxyacetylene torch and I pounded over one end to sort of peen it and give it a flat spot. Then I cut it off with the porta band, put it through the screw post that I made, got it back in the post vise, heated it up and beat it down again. This would essentially lock them in and almost kind of rivet over the ends. Um, and once they're cleaned up over on the grinder, they look perfect. The other benefit to this was it allowed me to have a pretty long uh, post that I can use as leverage to tighten this swivel down, but also kept them really slim because that one inch screw post that I made is pretty close to the vice body itself. And these things need to be pretty slim to avoid actually hitting the vice. Now over on my 2x72 grinder, I'm just cleaning up the edges and just trying to make these things look a little cleaner. I didn't do the greatest job peening them over. I'm definitely not a blacksmith um, and you know they didn't come out looking perfect, but they came out looking nice enough for me. Then I actually went ahead and heated these up red hot and let them cool. Now this is a trick that I learned from my friend Paul Pinto, who is a blacksmith, who you should subscribe to, that when you have milled or ground material, if you heat it up red hot and let it cool, it'll actually look as though it was forged that way. It kind of blends in some of the machining marks. So just heat these up uh, and let them cool down. And that allowed them to sort of blacken out and look really good and look like they came out forged that way. Cleaning them up with a wire wheel doesn't reveal any of the marks, but it does just sort of get a little bit of that scale and oxidation from the torch off of them. Now I can do another little test assembly and make sure these things work. They did need a little bit of tweaking because they were hitting the, the vice body in one or two spots, but just a little bit of time on the grinder and then I reheated them and everything worked out really well. They get super tight and they totally lock the vice in place when you needed to. Now with all that done, I was able to kind of do my final cleanup on the vise with the grinder. There was still a little bit of weld and some junk that had stuck on there from when I welded it and when the other person welded it. And I just cleaned up everything with the grinder and prepared myself to do the finishing. Now on this piece, I wanted to make sure that everything was properly wire wheeled. There was a lot of paint and kind of nooks and crannies and a lot of rust. Um, you know, I could have used a rust coated solution, something to pull the rust off, but I, I like the wire wheel look. I like the way that it, it leaves the material. And in the end, I was going for a natural sort of patina in the end of this. So getting everything prepped properly was important. Now I'm using a Sculpt Nouveau Black Magic spray on patina here. Now this is a natural metal patina. So this goes on raw metal that you've cleaned and degreased and it goes on in layers. And what it does is it Patina's the metal using a corrosive element. Um, it doesn't smell great. It doesn't feel good on your skin, but in the end it leaves a beautiful black finish that still allows you to see the characteristics of the raw metal beneath it, and I really, really like it. You build it up in a couple of layers uh, and rub it in. You use water to neutralize it. It's a really cool product. I'll leave a link down in the description of where you can get it. Um, and I bought a bigger bottle of it just because it goes pretty far. And the instructions say that once you're done with it, you can actually use a torch to get rid of some of the water that you use to neutralize it. And then you can go ahead and apply the next layer. So for here, I'm using some Sculpt Nouveau black wax. And this stuff is gorgeous. It goes on like a Johnson's paste wax, but it does help darken the metal even further. Uh, you leave it on, you let it sit for about an hour, and then you buff it off. And it leaves a really nice protective black finish. Now, this vise had been through a ton of work in its lifetime, and I really wanted to preserve the look of that. So I decided to not paint it and use this wax and patina so that you could highlight some of the braze joints that were done originally. Now, the only other part that this vise was missing was the back cap for the bell nut on the vise itself. So I found this piece of brass stock I had. It was about two and a half inches wide, and I used a two and a quarter inch hole saw to burn out a little slug that I could then turn into a back cap on the lathe. Now you can easily use a hole saw like this without the center drill. You just have to make sure your setup is nice and rigid. I didn't go close enough to the edge, so I wound up having to go over to the bandsaw and cut this off. But once it was done, I had a nice little slug that I can use over on the lathe to make a hollow cap. Now this was a little tricky to make, so it had to be a nice friction fit that would stay inside the back of the jaw, but it also had to be hollowed out so that the lead screw wouldn't hit it when the vise was fully tightened with no material in it. Now I sort of eyeballed this sizing. Um, I 
use my ghetto measuring method and I basically just creep on the cut until I get it correct and then I made that shoulder a little deeper. I just wanted it to be a tight friction fit and I figured I could always sort of muscle it in because it is just brass when it was done. I started out with a right hand cutter and actually went over to a boring bar and this gave me the best result to clear out this brass. And this probably isn't the correct operation to do it but it worked really well for me with, uh, with the boring bar with a carbide insert and it got me all the way inside the shoulder and gave me plenty of clearance so I knew I wouldn't hit the lead screw when everything was tightened up. Now once I was sure that this thing was going to fit, I tapped it in just for reassurance, uh, made sure that my friction fit was going to be good enough when I was all done, and then I was able to bang that piece back out and work on the opposite side. Now you can see I'm using some spacers behind my material, that's so that I could get it square to the back of the three jaw chuck but also um, grabbed firmly in the jaws themselves. So it's a little trick. You can use some space for material behind your material, tighten it down, and give you a little bit more room to work. Now working on the outside, I took away a considerable amount of material, and I tried to give it a bit of a domed look. So sort of just by working the knobs on the lathe, I moved my cutter in two directions, domed it over, and then used the file to clean it up. Then I actually just inserted it inside the bell nut, and the bell nut is extremely out of round, so I turned my lathe down really slow and just used the file to clean up the edge, trying to keep a constant pressure on it. Once this thing was cleaned up on the lathe, I was able to take it off and bring that and the jaws over to the bell grinder. This is a Broadbeck Ironworks 2x72. This thing is unbelievable. Um, it's a horizontal and vertical grinder with a VFD. Super well built and I'm really happy to have it in my shop. I'll throw a link down in the description of where you can check this thing out. I'm using a scotch Bright wheel on this and I can give it a ton of pressure and the VFD and the nice two horsepower motor, they don't bog down at all. I can use the slack belt feature on the top to round out the end of that little bell cap and then using the scotch bright belt you can see the nice smooth unified finish I get. With that all done I decided to take the wire wheel and clean up some of those braze joints just so that you'd be able to see them that much better and clean up a little bit of the lettering and the anvil. I also decided to clean up the slide so there'd be a nice contrast between the black and steel and the bright steel slide with some scotch bright and the wire wheel as well. Heading over to the bench, it was time for my final assembly. I put the pivoting bolt back in the bottom and decided to grease up and lubricate the screw posts with a little bit of grease. Now, you can always get things tighter with a little bit of grease on there and everything seemed to fit together nicely. I didn't do a tremendous amount of cleanup on the bottom of this base, but once everything was locked in place, I didn't want to add any grease down there because it is sort of a male-female fit on the bottom. I wanted it to lock in well. Put a little bit of grease on the jaw bolts and bolted those down. Added the bell cap and the lead nut. Put in my two pins to keep that all retained and added some grease to the lead screw itself before threading that in with the dynamic jaw. Now something that I had actually forgot about at this point was the lock for the dynamic jaw. There is a little locking washer that has to go in there and it uses 1032 screws. Uh, those threads were pretty chunky so I chased them out with a tap and then used some nice new Allen key 1032 screws that I had polished the ends on to keep that little washer retained. Now that allows the jaw to move in and out with the lead screw. The last thing I had to do was insert the bell cap and knock that in with a block of wood and this thing is fully assembled. I am so pleased with the way this thing came out. Um, I finished it off with some clear Johnson's Paste Wax and decided that I needed to highlight the Wilton text with a little bit of gold paint marker. I used a little gold oil-based paint marker to highlight that and sort of give a little bit more on the black and gold look. Uh, the black patina looks great and you can see all the scars that this vice has developed in its lifetime. You know, it's been built, used, and rebuilt, and I'm really happy to just give it some new life. I'm super pleased with the way the cast iron weld came out. It looks like it was there the whole time.
a little more paste wax on top of this thing once the paint from the paint marker had dried and this restoration is finished. All right, that about does it for this video. Man, this thing was a ton of work. Going into it, I knew it was gonna be a lot of work, but I really didn't expect to be making so many parts for it. That being said, I learned a tremendous amount on this project, and that's really why I enjoy restorations. Um, I love figuring out how to solve problems. You know, I'd never welded cast iron before. I'd never really milled jaws like this. It was, you know, so much to learn when you do something totally unknown like this. Uh, and I really enjoy getting to make things on the mill and lathe that are gonna be immediately functional like jaws or these little screw posts, the bell cap, all that stuff. Super happy with the patina and overall just really excited to get this thing into use in my shop. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. I've got a couple other things to restore, so if you're into this kind of stuff, there'll be more stuff coming. Drop a comment down below and let me know what you want to see. If you have any questions also, please leave them down below. I'd be happy to answer them. And I'll put links in the description to some of the stuff that I used to make this project happen. If you want to see what's going on behind the scenes in my shop, follow me here on Instagram at Make Everything Shop. I post a ton of behind the scenes stuff and I always am answering questions and sharing kind of my projects, mid project and all that. You can keep up on what's going on in the shop on a day to day basis. Again, I really hope you enjoyed this video. I am Chris Zepp from Make Everything, and I hope to see you on the next one. Thanks.